Okay. Welcome, everybody. We are here to interview Dr. Batachara. He is one of the SCPM 2023 awardees. So, first of all, congratulations, Janok. Um, my name is Maximiliano, uh, Maximiliano Paz, and I'm going to start first asking you about um, if you can tell us a bit of your background. Can you tell us, can you summarize your path to the geosciences? Sure. Um, so I'm Jonic Bettachere. I'm a, the Susan Cunningham Research Chair of, of uh, Geology at McMaster University. Uh, I was born in England, grew up in, uh, in St. John's, Newfoundland, where I did my uh, uh, elementary school, uh, high school and university training. Uh, I have a twin brother who was very keen to be an MD. Uh, interesting, when I moved to Newfoundland, um, they put us a year ahead, so I skipped grade three. And then there's only, there were only 11 grades in Newfoundland, so I was 16 when I started university, which is quite young. And at that age, there was there was no discussion about going to McGill or another Canadian university. So Memorial was the closest university. And the, the first year Memorial program was fairly prescribed. You were either on a, a science track or a humanities track. I was more or less on the science track, but I was adamant I didn't want to be an MD. So I took physics, chemistry, uh, I guess calculus, an English class. And then I had one other class, my twin brother took biology because he was definitely focused on being an MD, which he is. And I took geology because I just thought, in fact, I took geology for non-majors, um, thinking it might be a, just a, a fun class because I'd always kind of like maps. Uh, I did very well in the class, but I also quite enjoyed the physics and the calculus. And in my second year, I, I was sort of doing a lot of math, a lot of calculus, but I, I kept doing some geology classes. I did the second year mineralogy class and paleontology. Leslie Trolton was my instructor in, in mineralogy, and she nominated me uh, for a Canadian Student Mineralogist of the Year Award, which I won. I wasn't declared major in, in geology. Um, the other thing that happened at 16 is I bought a drum set and uh, started taking lessons and getting pretty good. So my third year of university, I switched out of, of, of science and went to music school for a year. But at the end of that year, I decided, yeah, I wasn't sure if being a professional orchestral percussion was really my thing. So I looked back at everything I had been doing, which was physics, calculus, and geology. And in my year of music school, I decided I'd take the field methods just so, so I would have my entire first, first and second year of, of geology under my belt. And I decided to, to wholeheartedly go back into geology. It just seemed like it was it was easy to me. It was less work than all the physics and calculus. I was getting A's. And the other good thing is I could play full time in a rock band on nights and weekends, which was my job, right? So my summer job was touring across the island of Newfoundland, playing in all the bars, making money to put myself through school. It wasn't that my, my parents weren't weren't were poor or anything, but you know, school was cheap. I think it was a few hundred bucks for tuition and you know, we made enough money in the band to pay rent and, and, and food and all that stuff. And so slowly but surely, I, I got dragged into geology. My first interest was in igneous petrology, and I did a bachelor's thesis on granites with Dave Strong, who was a volcanologist. But at the same time, the oil companies were recruiting right out of bachelors of science and, and undergraduate careers. At the tender age of 21, I was hired by SO Resources Calgary to go work in the oil patch. And that sort of got me out of the hard rock side of, of geosciences and into sedimentary geology. Um, I worked there for two and a half years. Can't say I loved it. At the same time, it was an absolutely fundamental experience because I learned about sequence stratigraphy and seismic stratigraphy. I didn't like seismic interpretation, but when I decided to go back and do a PhD after sort of being bored being an exploration geologist, I realized that what was missing was the the interpretation of cloniforms and surfaces to standard well log correlations that were very lithophases oriented. Something that I wrote about in a, in a paper that Vitor Bro and I, both past presidents of SCPM and the sedimentary record, we wrote about how geophysics saves stratigraphy. And so a lot of my career has been applying seismic stratigraphic concepts to the interpretation of well log and outcrop data. That of course we now call sequence stratigraphy, but the words modern sequence stratigraphy hadn't really been uh, invented in its full form. When I was a graduate student, I sort of applied seismic concepts to the Alberta Basin uh, using the, the, the terminology of owl stratigraphy 
to define surface bounded stratigraphic units, uh, but sequence trajectory more or less does the same thing. And so eventually I, I realized that that I had sort of uh, come up with this idea of sequence stratigraphic interpretation of, of outcrop and core, da core well log data at the same time that the Exxon Research Group were doing it in-house. And they presented their new sequence stratigraphy in about 1988-89 in exactly the same year, 89, that I finished my PhD student. So uh, all of a sudden I was in that early sort of vanguard of sequence stratigraphic researchers. Okay. Um, that, that was a nice summary. Let's start now with uh, some questions, with all the questions. We have more or less uh, 15 or 10 questions, depending on how much you want. But first, let's start with your career. Like, let's focus on some questions about your career. Not your music career, but the geology career. What are you most proud of uh, in your career? Most proud of? Uh, well, i got to say, uh, obviously, you know, when you're when I finished my PhD, PhD, 29, I guess, and I remember at that age, you know, I thought I was pretty good, I, I'll be honest with you, and I remember, you know, going at the, my first SEPM meetings and seeing people win these awards, but my PhD advisor and Jerry Middleton, both of whom are my kid, are both Petty John medalists, and I thought, man, will I ever reach that goal, you know, uh, what, what's it going to take for me to, to get there, and one of the amazing things about being a Petty John medalist is here I am, so many years later, Jerry Mendelton ran for president of SCPM and never won. So one of my proudest moments was being president of SCPM because it was sort of a, a total career achievement. And then to top that off with uh, with the Petty John is is just amazing. Uh, but to go back a little bit, you know, one of the things I will say about my career is I loved doing a PhD. It was one of the most fun things I ever did. I was pleased to bits when I finished it. I felt that I felt I never need to do anything again. I've done a single piece of original work. I said, anything I do beyond that is gravy. And here I am, I, I published my 100th paper last year. So I'm 100 papers past my PhD. And I, I sort of still feel, you know, I'm writing a textbook in first year earth history. So there's so many things to be proud of. But, you know, I was amazed I finished a PhD. You know, I just, that was such a great achievement and feeling of, of accomplishment. And I never felt I needed to do anything else, but I, of course I have done a lot more. And so every paper you sort of go, I just love to see that paper out the door and print is done, right? And then it takes on life of its own. People either read them or they don't, you know, and obviously it's, it's nice when you publish a paper that gets quoted a lot, but man, to be recognized by your peers with the Petty John is, is the, uh, it's the sweetest thing. I, I never really thought I'd get there. So getting there is kind of, I'm like, huh, me, what do I do? But so that was, that's, that's been an, just a lot of amazing experiences and uh, and accomplishments to uh, look back on. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go now to the other side of your career. Uh, have you encountered any challenges or setbacks that turn out to be valuable experiences? Yeah. So there've been so many. Uh, you know, when I was 16, 17, I was reading books by a woman named Anne Rand. I was very interested in being an entrepreneur, going to the big city of Calgary, working for the old business. You know, I, I was really excited about that. You know, in the end, that's not me. Um, I remember when I was working for the old business, it, it just wasn't, you know, I had a bachelor's degree. I wasn't really using my mental capacities to their limit. I would go to work and look at well logs, looking for, for high resistivity, high SP, pay, bypass pay, in, in shallow uh, sandstones in the Alberta basin. And, and it was pretty boring work. Then I'd go home and I'd be reading Jacob Bernowski and Stephen Jay Gould. And I realized that, the, that my boredom with my job was just not acceptable. And so that challenge led me to think about going back to get a university education, a PhD. So the challenge of not loving my first into the oil business, you know, led to the return to academia. And then of course, when I went to school, the price of oil was, was in the dumps. And everyone said, oh, you're going back to school at a great time because when you graduate, there's going to be all sorts of jobs. But there weren't. There were no academic jobs. There were, there were very few oil company jobs. So once again, I graduated during a very challenging time. And, you know, by hook or by crook, I managed to find a, a postdoc with the late great Grant Mossop. So I sort of hid away in Edmonton for a couple of years where I met my wife, Cindy. 
And then once again, two years later, it was still slim pickings, you know. So in, eight, in 91, at the end of my postdoc, once again, I was very interested in academic jobs, never want to go back to the oil business, but, you know, I, I ended up with, with three opportunities. One was a, a, a bid to join Shell Research's lab. The first offer I got was with Atlantic Richfield Company in the States. I'd never heard of them, but they were looking to, to, to build a sequence distributed research group. And then I got an offer for an interview, I think it was at the University of Melbourne, but the Melbourne interview came after I'd already accepted the job with ARCO, and the Shell interview never quite crystallized. So in the end, I, I really only had one opportunity that, that came to fruition, and that was to go work in Dallas, Texas with Atlantic Richfield Company. My wife wasn't very excited about moving the state, so there was a challenge there, but you know, her, she had just finished a master's degree and there, there wasn't much for her in Edmonton. So we left and moved to the United States. What was interesting is we left Edmonton and the first assignment was Alaska. And my buddy Sean O'Connell told me that I was the only person that ever went from Edmonton and moved to a place that was colder at any rate. And so uh, once again, there I am working for Big Oil. Admittedly, it was in a research job. I got to work with some of the most brilliant brains in the world, like Henry Post Mentier, uh, who everybody will know, uh, a guy named Alton Brown, who you won't know, but he was an extremely brilliant uh, carbonate sedimentology petroleum systems person, you know, and some great colleagues like Bill Morris that, uh, you know, we would we would do nothing but argue about uh, geology. And then, you know, I, I quit ARCO twice. So again, I'd never like working there, challenge. The first time I went to work for the Bureau of Economic Geology, which was a great place to work, but my wife's career was taken off in Dallas, so she wasn't able to move. And after two years of living apart, I quit that job and very reluctantly went back to ARCO because they were begging me to come back. Once again, I wasn't very happy there. And a year and a half later, the opportunity at the University of Texas at Dallas came up. For some reason, there just wasn't a lot of people applying for jobs in those days. And they had a bunch of applicants. I applied very late for the job, and for some reason, the job, it just seemed like that job was designed for me. So that was when I got my first academic job, and uh, it was a big cut and pay challenge, you know, uh, going from a big, wealthy oil company to a, a lowly paid, you know, untenured associate professor. That was a huge risk, but uh, I hoped that I was up to it, and that I would get tenure and be a successful academic. And uh, I've had two endowed chairs position and I get paid very well now. So it all works out, you know. <laughs> mm. Would you do something differently if you could go back in time? Uh, you Tough know, question. I do say, yeah, I, I do tell, I tell students, you know, to a degree the path chooses you. You know, at one point I really was interested in paleontology and, I, and after my PhD in plastics, I thought, I'm going to do a postdoc in carbonate sedimentology. I approached Noel James and Colin Stern. Neither of them had funding or, or showed a lot of interest. You know, Noel and I are good colleagues to this day, but um, uh, so that didn't work out. And then I thought I might do a postdoc with George Pemberton for some for just complicated reasons. That didn't work out. So all of my attempts to sort of get into the bio paleo side of geology failed. Um, and yet, when I was at Dallas as a as a uh, as a associate professor, uh, James McKecker, who I I've known since he was a grad student, said, "Hey, can I do a sabbatical?" I'm like, a "Sabbatical with me in Dallas? Like, who wants to come to Dallas? It's just a big American city." But uh, James wanted to develop a new short course in ecology, and he wanted, but he also wanted to know if I could pay for him for any living expenses. I said, "Well, the best way to pay you is to teach a course. Now you're not supposed to teach a course on sabbatical." But James wanted to, to redo that class, so he taught that class to my grad students. I sat through the whole thing. James and I wrote a couple of papers, uh, two of which have been quoted hundreds and hundreds of times, one of which is the hyperpicnal paper in JSR that we published in, uh, whenever that is, 2005 or 2009. So, um, you know, so I sort of regretted not getting more into paleontology, but in the end, I managed to to get to it through the back door by by working with uh, with some of George's students. So I would never call myself a paleontologist, uh, but I do have some interest in technology and uh, dabble in it. And, you know, some years ago I did an SEPM conference with James and 
Murray Gingra and George in the technology conference. Again, I led the field trip. I remember George complimenting me on my ability to identify trace fossils. So, and eventually George and I wrote some papers together. So, uh, you know, we had some disagreements in the past, but we reconciled on those. So, yeah, you know, there's there's some things that never quite worked out. So, uh, maybe those were decisions I, I would have changed. But you know, I'm not a guy to look back. You know, I look at the success I've had and and just say, you know. You don't always you don't always get to make choices. Sometimes you just have to take the best of the opportunities that are presented to you. Okay, now let's move to another type of questions, more on to like um, your daily schedule and your work life balance. How do you manage your time and maintain work life balance? Well, I'm very blunt here. Cindy and I never had kids, and that was. More, more or less circumstances rather than a great decision or choice. And uh, we get along very well together. Um, I like to sleep. I don't use an alarm clock unless some fool has an eight o'clock meeting, which is very rare, or I've got to catch a plane. So usually I'm well rested. <clears throat> when I turned 38 and started doing field work, I decided I had to get fit. So I started running and, and doing marathons. I've only done three, but I do try to keep fit. Um, I wake up, have my cup of coffee, read the paper, go for my run, wander into school, or if, or if I walk to school, I'll just, it's about a half an hour walk each way. You know, I get work around 10 o'clock. I don't, I usually just, I'll have a quick lunch at my desk. When I work, I'm very focused, extremely focused. I read fast and I write fast. You know, I know what my, I know what my, uh, my skills or my gifts are. You know, I don't sweat writing papers and I, and I read fast. I review fast. And so those are really good skills as an academic. I know lots of colleagues of mine who don't love writing and, and it's painful for them. One of the reasons I've written 100 papers is that I'm fast at it. You know, whether I'm good at it is another question, but I, I write fast and edit quickly. So um, that means I don't, I don't, and I'm very, I can be extremely focused when needed to be. So when I work, I work very efficiently. I've had colleagues tell me I'm a workaholic and that's because they can't believe how much stuff I get done. But that's because I work efficiently. It's not because I'm working 24-7, you know. I don't work weekends. I take my holidays. I go for my runs. My wife and I like to have, some, you know, a few glasses of wine every night. And we cook nice dinners. She keeps me very healthy with good food and, and you know, a fruit salad in the morning. Uh, and I'm a social guy. I've got lots of friends. I like to I entertain. I've got my friend coming over for her birthday supper tonight. We're going to cook some Mexican food, because you can't get, me get Mexican food here in Ontario. So, um, you know, I really value, value my work-life balance. You know, I get a lot done, but the flip side is I don't have kids. I don't have anyone to pick up after school. I don't have anyone to take care of except my wife. And, um, you know, so I've, I've for, by hook or by crick, I, I don't have, my parents have both passed away. I'm not dealing with, you know, which is a sad thing. They died when I was in my 30s. So in some ways, there is. I feel sad when I when I have friends of mine whose parents are in their 80s and 90s, but sometimes they're also taking care of them, running around, you know. So I I just don't have the responsibilities that many other people my age do, and so that gives me time to work hard enough to get more done than a lot of people, and yet leaves plenty of time for myself and for my wife and my friends and my family, and uh, and that gives me uh, a feeling of calmness. Plus, you know. I eat well and I, I keep fit. Are there days that you don't want to go to work or do you always enjoy what you do? Well, I would say 90% of the time I'm having the time of my life. Uh, I am moving into an administrative job and I've done administrative jobs before. Every once in a while in a sort of a job as as what well, you younger folks won't know, but you know, there's going to be someone who's complaining about something, there's going to be a problem. Sometimes students have problems that are very difficult. I remember once I had a student that was doing some training on a rope. He fell on the rope, broke both his legs. Uh, that was a hard day. Um, mm -hmm. I remember once I made the foolish mistake of asking students at the end of field camp to write reviews of the class. I have never received more brutal complaining reviews. And the next day I decided I can't go to work. Uh, it was in the middle of summer and I got the review. So I went to OzFest that day and listened to a lot of loud music and, and got the stress out of my system. So 
but it's pretty rare. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you get writer's block and you just go like, man, I just, I just can't work anymore, but I'm good at taking breaks and then, you know, I'll go, go for a walk or it's okay, end of the day, have a beer with my wife and just kind of calm and relax. Um, but for the most part, I, I love working. The, the one thing I do like about my life is that, you know, aside from absolutely having to be on campus to teach classes, go to meetings, and, and now with Zoom, you know, I can work at home if I want to, I can work at the office. So I have lots of different work areas. So I'm not a slave to having to be here at a time or having to be, be at a place. So that flexibility makes it a lot easier to tolerate, uh, to tolerate work. And that's very different from I found working for Big Oil where they more or less expect you to be there more or less from you know nine to five or eight to four, whatever it is. Uh, so I do love the uh, the flexibility of being a, a a tenured full professor where there's very little constraints on on how you do your work. So as long as you get as long as you publish papers, bring in money, and turn out students, everyone gives you pats on the back, and no one really asks or cares how you do the work. Okay, so a nice work life balance then. Uh, now, now we have like a more philosophical question. Uh, how do you, do you define success and fulfillment? What is your opinion in those words? Are they interchangeable uh, within the context of your experience? How do you define them? So that's a, uh, an interesting question. Um, success uh, is typically defined externally. You know, people will say, oh, that person's successful. They've got a big house. They had, they own a Porsche, you know, uh, hmm. you know, they're the boss, whatever. Uh, fulfillment is a very personal thing, right? There's lots of people who are very successful and profoundly unfulfilled, right? So for example, uh, you know, I'm a, a progressive rock fan from way back. One of my favorite bands was a band called Emerson, Lake and Palmer, you know, there's three guys in the band. The, the youngest was the drummer. He was the happiest go lucky guy. Was thrilled at 19 to be in this famous rock band. Keith Emerson was a was a uh, a, a very well respected uh, British uh, sort of a back backing musician. Backed up a a black woman singer named P. J. Arnold. Then he formed a band called the Mice. Um, but you know he was the leader of the band, but he was insecure, nervous under a lot of pressure and he committed suicide at 69 because his fingers gave up and he couldn't play anymore. In my opinion, he was one of the most successful musicians, rock stars all time. So to me, he was like the ultimate example of success. And yet clearly his, his depression, drinking and, and sense of lack of fulfillment resulted in a very tragic end for him. So, um, uh, one of my best buddies, uh, and I, he's a geologist, we kind of think alike. And, you know, we were just chatting once and he just said, man, you just have to like yourself, you know? And uh, if you don't like yourself, uh, you may never feel fulfilled. You know, there's yeah. lots of people out there, and I've met many of them who are so amazing. And yet, you know, who knows, maybe, you know, we have, we, I don't want to get too into psychotherapy and psychology. My dad was a psychiatrist and my twin brother is. You know, but there's a lot of people out there who are never fulfilled, doesn't matter how successful they are. So. So to me, this, the secret to my success is being amazed by, by it, as opposed to, uh, a, a friend of mine gave me the formula. that some people, their ambition exceeds their abilities, and other people, their abilities exceed their ambitions. I suspect that my abilities are a little bit more than my ambitions. So I'm always, it's not that I'm not ambitious, but I've never been ambitious for things that I can't achieve with, with what I believe is to be a, a reasonable amount of effort. And so when I win things like the Petty John, I'm like, huh, am I completely surprised? I'm like, well, you know, I look at how many citations I have. I know how many other awards I've aware, AEP, Judy Select. So I'm not totally surprised I won at some point, yet I'm also like, huh, uh, I never really thought I'd get there, but there it is, right? So I think being mildly su surprised by your success is, is the path to fulfillment. You know, if you win the Petty John medal and your only your only reaction is 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 anger because it wasn't the Nobel Prize, of course there is no Nobel Prize in geology, then you're going to be an unfulfilled, unhappy person, right? So the, the, the trick is to 
you know, it doesn't help. To, I think you have to have some ambition because with no ambition, you might be one of those person that's got incredible potential and never reaches it, right? So a human has to find that that tricky balance between ambition to go for it and yet not be so overinflated that your ambition exceeds your ability. Let me give you a good example. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes had enormous ambition. She dropped out of Stanford, started a company called Theranos, and her ambition and belief that a prick of blood could be analyzed for all these diseases and her ability to get to become the youngest billionaire failed because her ambition feed, uh, was way larger than her ability to actually achieve her aims, right? And now she's in jail if you've been following the Theranos case, right? So there is an example of where, where someone where the ambition also becomes psychopathic. It's completely out of whack with respect to reality, right? Okay, that's interesting. Let's, let's move to another type of questions, uh, more chill questions. <laughs> <laughs> on the future of geoscience, more or less. Um, how is, in your opinion, how has this geoscience field changed over the years, uh, right? And how do you see geoscience and research evolving in the coming years? I'm going to be more specific because I can't really speak to geoscience as a whole. Um, but uh, so I'll talk about sedimentary geology because it's SEPM. Um, so Oh, back in my uh, Dallas days, when I became an academic, I met Bill Hawk. Uh, Bill Hawk, who you may know, you know, the, the father of the of the global cycle charts, worked at Exxon and ended up at National Science Foundation. And I met him at an IS, an IS conference, I think, in 1998 in Alicante, Spain. He took a shine to me and dragged me into NSF. I never got money from them. I had plenty of money from oil companies, so I didn't need U.S. government money, but um, but we, he started the Source to Sink project, and the idea was to, and he and I talked about this many times, because I, I, I did a lot of of uh, meetings with him to review, A, to help write the science plan, and then review the proposals when they came in, and he was adamant that, um, that sedimentary geology needed to become more quantitative, and at the same time, I started interacting with people like Chris Paola, at uh, Minnesota and Rudy Slingeland at Pennsylvania uh, and and others, all very very quantitative, uh, mathematically oriented sedimentology stratigraphers. Uh, you know Pete Burgess, who I think is still editor of JSR, uh, and even uh, John Southern, who was you know one of the founders of of and Jerry Middleton, who was sort of the the founders of of integrating physics and sedimentology. And I think that uh, that that what was initiated by John Southern and Jerry Middleton, and Gary Parker and, and Chris Peel has now achieved fruition. I, I look at I look at who's running SCPM now. Hi Liz, if you ever listen to this, Liz Hey Jack, Carl Straub, Doug Edmonds. I mean, they're the new face of, of sedimentary geology. Uh, and we have similar folks here in Canada, Steve Hubbard at, at Calgary, who uh, studied with 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 uh, Steve Graham at Stanford. You know, and it's 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 the integration of physics to do really good quantitative sedimentary geology. However, it has to be founded on great field work. I look at people like Charlie Kierens, Isabel Montanez, you know, who are all now senior SEPM folks, and they all understand, you know, they're a bit more on the carbonate, you know, maybe uh, chemistry side of things, but they, they all start with good field work, right? So I so I think the the, the, the future is those folks that understand that, that the story can't be told without good field work, but you have to use new tools and you have to use the basic principles of chemistry and physics to understand the science. Also, the revolutions in big data, numerical modeling, uh, you know, uh, are going to revolutionize things. This is a bit of an aside that I want to talk about. Yet, yesterday, I, I did my first experiment with ChatGP. So I opened it up and I asked a simple question. What's the difference between Alice stratigraphy and sequence stratigraphy? Its answer was not very well written and completely wrong. I then asked it uh, for another question on forced regressions. And again, it gave me a, 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 a rather moderately well written answer that just had buckets of, admit, of misinformation in it. So right now, uh, I wouldn't recommending students use ChatGP 
to write any papers in sequence stratigraphy, it doesn't know what it's talking about. However, you know, I, I go to APG conferences and people talk about machine learning. I'm not sure it's there yet. I, I still think think that humans and geologists with their with their concepts, knowledge, and experience need to be the ones interpreting geologic data. Uh, and we need to see computers, artificial intelligence as tools to help us rather than uh, crutches to, uh, uh, to, to lean on. Yeah, that's a nice insight on, on artificial intelligence. Let's talk about a bit on uh, sustainability now. What impact has geoscience research and practice made to ensure human sustainability? And what resources should we capitalize on uh, to reach it? So that's another uh, fundamental question. So I'm writing a textbook on the history of our planet. It's a first year Earth history textbook, very narrative oriented. Uh, I've got political reasons for writing the book. One is to improve science literacy in concepts like evolution and the age of the Earth, particularly in in the United States, where, where those concepts are, are typically avoided because, for perhaps obvious reasons, a lot of people don't like to be confronted with, with, with the realities of the age of our Earth, the concepts of evolution that uh, obviously go against, you know, mythological, uh, 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 mythological uh, ideas such as what's in uh, the, the, the Genesis, uh, you know, uh, Bible, whatever it is. But at any rate, um, so I've been thinking a lot about global warming sustainability, and I've learned a lot in the past four or five years. And so my final chapter is on the Anthropocene. Um, and the big question is, if, you know, there is no question, for example, that anthropogenic CO2, largely from the burning of fossil fuels, is causing global warming. Uh, and that that global warming is going to have consequences. That could be certainly serious. It's not going to destroy the planet, but it's, it's certainly it are going to cause displacement of communities. It may cause local extinctions. It, it could, you know, possibly cause a mass extinction. That's that's very much under investigation. The very fact that it could be an ex existential threat to our habitats, our homes, our cities, perhaps to our species, we must consider that. However, that has to be tempered with the realities of the economic costs of how to mitigate those risks. And so therefore you can't, science simply can't answer those questions we can inform about the rates of change, about, about the potential physical consequences of global change, and then we have to in, then we have to talk to our economists or our politicians and talk about what could be implemented with the least amount of damage to humans on the planet now. For example, an instantaneous ban on fossil fuels would shut down transportation immediately without an alternative, and billions of people would starve. Wars would break out civil wars would break out. And we're seeing this right now in many countries where they don't have resources that the West enjoys. The other thing that uh, geology provides is the deep time perspective. It allows us to go back and look at things like the Cretaceous extinction and the Permian extinction, look at the causes. What's so interesting about extinctions is that with the exception of the Cretaceous extinction that was that was a result of volatiles generated by the, the, Ch the Chicxulub uh, uh, asteroid that 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 basically shut down photosynthesis that that killed the herbivores that killed the carnivores that killed the dinosaurs um, the permian extinction is very different that was the co2 story co2 released by volcanoes uh, that basically volatilized uh, peat and coal deposits stored in in the siberian basin uh, as a result of massive volcanism probably over a few tens of thousands of years i've done some back of the envelope calculations and it's possible the rate of CO2 release from the Siberian traps might be similar to the rate of CO2 release in the Anthropocene. If that's true, then we could be releasing CO2 to a rate that truly could trigger a mass extinction. Uh, and it's only by looking at deep time and looking at the catastrophes, catastrophes that have occurred, whether they're minor, ext minor extinctions or mass extinctions, uh, it's, it's, that's one of the best ways to really understand uh, how much we have to fear the global change that we're inducing. And um, there is risk. There is cost to mitigate that risk. The cost is not trivial. It's trillions of dollars to sequester CO2. Uh, it's, it's, it's trillions of dollars to, to change from, from fossil fuels to, to renewables. 
Um, and uh, I tell my students the hope is light bulbs. You know, light bulbs went from being 100 watts to five watts in my lifetime. And who knows what kind of massive orders of magnitudes, improvements and efficiency we'll see as we go to electric vehicles or, 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 or uh, mass commuter, maybe solar powered trains. So I think the future is bright, but it requires you, not you personally, but your generation to do the science and, 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 and the engineering innovations and keep, keep uh, interacting with the politicians and the economists because it's a global problem. And it can't just be solved with science. Yet, you, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's incumbent on all of us, all of you out there who might be listening to me, particularly the young folks, to read well, well outside of geology so they understand what the, what's required to, to achieve societal change. You know, it can't just be done with good science. That science has to be translated into good policy. And so a few of you need to think about getting advanced degrees in, in business, maybe going to politics, and then, and then, and also just in communicating your science beyond your peer group and communicate it to the general public uh, so that they truly understand the science. Because there's so much misinformation out there, it makes it hard for the, the person on the street to really understand the science behind the, uh, the predictions about global warming, as an example, and, and the sustainable solutions that might be required. Well, you actually brought a bridge to the next question, talking about the communicating you know, to the public. Let's talk about outreach. Um, do you think geoscientists are doing a good job at outreach to non-geoscientists? What can we do better? So, again, that's a, that's a very broad question. Um, hard for me to answer, but let me, let me give you an example, maybe a little bit uh, left field from what you're thinking. So, I'll, not, I'll go back to my textbook. So, my textbook is designed to improve science literacy particularly about the geological science and particularly about the history, about the deep time history of our planet and evolution that actually has implications for society. Um, uh, and the idea is to have more students taking Earth history class rather than just physical geology. So the average American who goes to university knows a bit about plate tectonics and earthquakes and volcanoes because they're into historical geology, they're not really clear about evolution or maybe they don't believe it because they're, you know, a young earth creationist or whatever it is. So in writing this book, uh, you know, one of my personal goals is to visit every natural history museum in the world. And so recently I was at the Field Museum of, of Chicago and they have such an amazing exhibit there. I've read that more, more people visit museums and go to football games. Uh, the Royal Ontario Museum has an amazing new exhibit on the origin and early life. It's just, it's a world-class exhibit. Downtown Toronto, it's always packed to the, packed the gills with, with families taking their kids there. You know, I used to love going to the Houston Museum of Natural History. Um, uh, I lived in Big D, the, the, you know, Ross Perot, who ran for the President of the United States, put his money where his mouth is and put a massive new, fantastic Natural History Museum right in downtown uh, Dallas. So there you go, Ross Perot, you know, who ran for president of the United States as an independent, decided we need more science literacy. When Ross Perot was running for president of the United States, he said, folks, we need to make computer chips, not potato chips. You won't remember that because you probably weren't following that election. I love that line. You know, America's got to make more computer chips, not potato chips. And he was, he was sort of giving a little jab at, 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 Jimmy, at Jimmy Carter, who was a peanut farmer, right, you know? And uh, Bill Clinton, who sort of came from Arkansas, where they grow a lot of chickens, right, and potato chips. Um, so science literacy in general is important. Um, you know, when I was in Houston, we used to do Earth Science Day. And again, as part of the Gulf section of SEPM, we would do a little outreach at the Houston Museum of Natural History with a timeline. And, and uh, uh, several of us would go there. And as, as a president, I would go and help them out. Could we do more? Um, you could always do more, but you know, uh, as SCPM members, you know, as budding sedimentologists, don't forget about your museums. Those are the, those are some of the first 
modes of outreach that certainly North Americans that live in big cities will have will have access to. You know, uh, you look at the U.S. There's great natural human musician uh, museums. You know, in 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 Houston, Dallas, uh, all, you know, all over the place. You know, Chicago, New York, obviously, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, L.A. You know, lots of uh, cities have great museums. How do you get out the word more? Uh, you know, I think we need to we need to fight school boards when they try to get intelligent dining and creationism taught in schools. Don't let them get the better of us. You know, we need to make sure that our that 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 our kids are scientifically literate, uh, and uh, we need more science teachers that understand science, and we don't start replacing science with pseudoscience and uh, you know all this uh, fake news. I mean, there, there's a huge uh, push towards science literacy and fake news, particularly in the United States and globally. Uh, you know, people that just believe garbage, you know, and flat earthers. And I mean, you know, if they ever take over the government, it's going to be a very sad day for scientists. And don't laugh, you know, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, you know, when they had their revolution, if you were trained in Western and were a scientist, you were more than likely to be dragged out to the fields and buried alive, right? That was the killing fields, just because you had Western science education, which was anathema to those those Eastern communist countries back during their, you know, when I was grooving to Deep Purple in 1970, you know, uh, scientists and doctors were being murdered in, in Cambodia for just believing in Western science and taking an enlightened approach. I encourage everyone to read Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. Steven Pinker is one of my, another one of my heroes. He's a psychoneurolinguist who wrote, writes about uh, scientific thought and literacy. And how the mind works. Okay, Let, let's. Uh, now I I would like some opinion of you from uh, key transferable skills. So what what are some of the key transferable skills that you have been able to develop over your career, and which skills do you think that are most pivotal for students uh, to develop during their career uh, prospects? Yeah, and that's a. Uh... Uh, another interesting question uh, because a lot of this comes down to who you are, your personality, uh, having a very clear knowledge of yourself and knowing what your strengths and your weaknesses are. So for example, one of my strengths is I read fast and I write fast. One of my weaknesses is I talk too fast. Okay. Having said that, when I was in high school, when I was in grade, I had a stutter. Luckily, the stutter went away. I don't know why. And uh, but I was also always very interested in theater. And from grade, when I moved to Newfoundland in grade eight, I, I started off in theater as, as a young boy. And I did a little bit of, you know, I did. I was president of my high school drama club. Then I bought a drum kit, and then I went in, into drumming. But to this day, I still use some of those learnings I got from being in, you know, doing a you know, a, a summer course in acting skills, you know, how to speak loudly to an audience, how to speak with passion, you know, and and I've always been naturally good at that, maybe a bit too fast, but, you know, I, I remember when I was an AP Distinguished Lecturer, but well, that comes from just being good at speak, speaking, right? Some of that is lessons, you know, I actually had lessons in acting, and obviously communication skills are critical, right? Um, if you're not a great speaker, join Toastmasters, you know, get some experience, right? I give students uh, lectures on how to give a good presentation. Uh, when you're at a conference, don't just look at the talk, think about why you like the talk. What was it about the presentation that worked? What was it about the slides that looked good, you know, and, and see if you can build that into your own presentation. Most students don't like, most people don't like presenting, they're afraid to talk to groups. You have to practice that. You know, as a younger person, I would practice talks. I would do storyboards. I learned how to do a storyboard when I was in, uh, you know, I did I did one or two classes on filmmaking. And so I learned how to do a storyboard. And that's a great way to give a talk, right? A slide is a series of, 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 of still images. You can put uh, motion in them, but the movie part is your, your conversation and your talk that goes with the static slides. So it's a little bit like organizing a movie, right? Um, so, 
communication skills are critical. The other thing is networking skills. You know, uh, again, some of that comes down to person. If you're a very shy person, maybe you, so I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you a story. A, a, a relative of mine, I won't say who, told me, he says, I go to conferences, I don't say a word to anybody, and then I leave two or three days later. Well, I go to a conference, I can't get across the conference forward APG, because everyone wants to say, hey, John, how's it going, right? So sometimes when I'm trying to get out of the conference floor, I almost need to kind of cover my face, right? Because I'm very well networked. I'm an outgoing person, I'm, I'm a social person. This, this uh, relative of mine can be social, but he's a lot more reserved than I am, and just doesn't have the same networking and communication skills. Um, having said that, you know, I'm not sure I was a great listener when I was a young man. The older I get, and I was a volunteer crisis pregnancy counselor for Planned Parenthood when I was 30, uh, 29 to 30, and I took like months of, of training in, in uh, options counseling. And you had to, you had to learn how to uh, give feedback in a gentle way and ask questions in a way that allowed people to give you information in a non-judgmental way. And as much as I can, I, I obviously this is a conversation where I'm talking, but I like to do a lot of listening and listen very carefully to people before I speak. And how many times you've been talking to someone where you can tell all they're waiting is, is for the opportunity to one up you? You know, oh, I'm writing a book, or really, oh, I wrote a book last week, you know, you know, and I've got relatives of mine who I love to death, but all they ever want to do is one up me, right? So the conversation is, is it's all about them trying to one up me. Whereas, you know, a good listener will draw people in and you'll gain people's trust and you'll gain people's support. So being a good listener is key. Having a good network is key to success. Uh, and uh, being very, very aware of your skills and strengths. And yes, of, of the areas of, of your personality, work habits <coughs> that need to be fixed, right? Uh, and sometimes you've got to ask for, for honest feedback from people, you know. How is that talk? You know, what what did I do wrong? You know, and if you want to be an academic, you get feedback all the time because you submit a paper, gets rejected, and then you gotta rush it off and just redo it, right? If you get angry at a rejection and just end up being angry at the person who rejected you, you're never gonna get anywhere. You know, you have to accept the you have to accept the criticism and move on. My my first academic boss, Bob Stern, said you can always tell a successful professor they have more scars on them than everybody else because they're used to constant uh, rejection, and they just have to brush themselves off and try to do better. Okay, we are almost finishing with these questions. Uh, so, which challenges in securing job opportunities? Um, I mean, sorry, uh, why should why do you think somebody should consider a career in geosciences today? I mean, with all the challenges that we have nowadays, uh, securing job opportunities. So. Again, that's a, you, so you made a statement that I don't agree with. Uh, however, it sort of depends on, on the choices that you want to restrict yourselves to. So when I came to Mac, I left the University of Houston uh, when oil prices were really high. Uh, for a while there, the University of Houston had, I think we had 400 graduate students in geosciences at the University of Houston. 400 graduate students and an equal number of undergraduates. That's an enormous program. Where were those students getting jobs? Well, hey, it's Houston. There were jobs, okay? One o'clock forward 11 years later, well, the price of oil is coming back, but, you know, um, obviously when the price of oil plummeted back down to, you know, gas was, was basically free, you know, interest rates were negative, uh, and all of a sudden, the University of Houston's enrollment dropped. In the meantime, what happened at McMaster, where where I had jumped ship to? Well, we don't have a we don't have an Earth Science program at McMaster. We have an Earth and Environmental program, an Environmental Science program, and then a, a BA in Geography at the undergraduate level. And I admittedly, I had a number of students who came to me in my early days at Mac, thinking about careers in oil and gas. Only one out of my many undergraduate students and graduate students has managed to secure a position in the oil and gas business. However, all the other students have been employed in the environmental consulting business. 
every, you know, Ontario is the, is the largest province by population in Canada with over, not sure what it is, 10, 10 15 million uh, people. Every single construction site needs environmental analysis, groundwater, soil, and the subsurface geology. Uh, there's all sorts of rivers that need to be evaluated. And so all of my, all of my students are getting jobs in, uh, as geomorphology or subsurface uh, stratigraphers in the environmental business. Maybe it doesn't pay as much as the oil and gas, there's also a mining boom in Canada, so some of my undergraduates are working in the mining business. Uh, and uh, so my observation is they're all getting jobs. So there's lots of opportunity in, in, uh, in, in mining, in certainly Canada. I can't speak globally. Uh, every construction site needs environmental assessments. Uh, and so I think there's lots of opportunities for geoscientists globally. Um, and uh, students have to be flexible. Kind of comes back to the previous question you asked about what are your soft skills. So, uh, admittedly, I'm not particularly computer savvy, but learn R, learn Python, learn statistics, work with big data. You know, uh, the other thing about geologists is that if you do field geology, you have to make an incredible number of decisions. What's the grain size? What's the sedimentary structure? What's the color? What's the environment? What's the stratigraphic context? And you have, to, you have to make decisions and they have to be correct. If you get the grain size wrong and the sedimentary structure wrong, the environment of, de of deposition is wrong. If the environment of de deposition is wrong, then you see a change, that change is wrong. So then your sequence boundaries are wrong, your flooding surface is wrong. So one small mistake in interpretation of sedimentary structure can cascade to a completely wrong interpretation of sequence stratigraphy. One of the reasons why geologists make good managers and politicians is they're used to making a thousand decisions when they're doing field work. It's something that people don't appreciate about the nature of geosciences is, is, is where we force students to make decisions about, about something. It may seem simple, what are you looking at? But it's really important, you have to know what you're looking at and your decision and observation has to be correct. And the ability to make decisions about a lot of complicated things to build a complex picture in 3D is why geologists can be very successful. One of my people I met, I was kind of awestruck when I met him was, uh, uh, Jim Riley, who was the first astronaut I ever met, did his PhD at UT Dallas and would visit us regularly. And, uh, you know, after giving this talk, he'd strip off his NASA costume when we go for beers. Very down to earth guy. I, I think recently he was the, the head of the geological survey uh, at the uh, USGS. But I asked him, what, what was it about your, your undergraduate training that, that we, you found best being an astronaut? He said it was the ability to think in 3D. So there's an example where you know, a, a skill he learned as a geologist gave him the uh, uh, something that he needed to be an astronaut. So, uh, you know, at Astro, you know, the world is yours, right? So I, I think, you know, geoscience is a great opportunity. It's not as competitive as those folks trying to get into med school. Uh, and if you're good and open-minded, you can have a great career. So I never see geoscience as limiting. So I've certainly had the best career imaginable. And you know, I spent time in government surveys, oil companies, academia. Now I'm writing a book for undergraduates, and who knows, maybe when I finish this, I'll I'll start writing. You know, I started doing like op-eds for the lo local newspaper, so maybe I'll write something scientific for the general publication and give back in that way. Yeah, and, and you're actually talking about the question that I'm going to ask you now. Like, what do you wish to get involved now? like in the future, looking at the future trajectory of geosciences, uh, what do you wish to get involved in? Yeah, so that the future for me is gonna be uh, less what I call new research in my detailed area of focus, uh, other than finishing up, you know, I've got lots of data sets from PhDs and masters that go back 20 years, and a good data set can last forever. So, you know, some of, that, some of those are good stories I wanna get out, but, you know, synthesizing a lifetime of thinking about rocks there's there's a few papers that so i tend to write more think piece papers and concept papers than than you know hypothesis testing and i'm getting very interested in communicating to the masses uh it's starting with writing a textbook when that's done which is going to be done and it's going to be done at the end of this month uh I'll, I'll take a bit of a break move into my leadership role and then as i move towards retirement of course, I'm not the kind of guy that will ever truly retire from being a scientist, but 
But I like the idea of saying, how do we communicate science better to the general public, particularly to address the incredible ignorance um, uh, and fake news there? I'll give you an example. I, I, I met a young person about 35 a few years ago, a relative, and he was asking me about conspiracy theories. What I thought about them, I looked at him, I said, well, you know, so look at the Apollo missions. You know, there's a lot of people that believe the Apollo missions were faked. And a lot of the arguments against them being fake, and a lot of the arguments that, that people say, oh, they're fake because, you know, there was a flag waving or there's no stars in the photographs. It's all these kind of little goofy details. And I say, wait a minute, think about the bigger picture. Which president of the United States was in power for every Apollo mission that went to the moon? There was only one. The guy's name was Richard Nixon. Now, he convinced five folks to break into the Water hotel, Watergate Hotel and try to steal some information about the upcoming Democratic uh, primaries. They got caught, and a lot of them went to jail, and he was impeached and resigned. He recorded all of his conversations in the White House, but somehow we're, we're asked to believe that that chump who couldn't keep five guys quiet a simple break-in somehow managed to keep 400,000 NASA employees quiet over the next 50 years. You know, let alone how do you fake the age of moon samples? And th this guy looked at me and said, "Wow, I've never heard an explanation that made so much sense to me." And I said, "Let me give you an example. Another example. There was this little nasty person called Charles Manson. He convinced five of his followers to go out and commit horrible murders for a genuine conspiracy." His conspiracy was called Helter Skelter. He said, black Americans are gonna rise up and start a civil war. They're gonna win, but they're not gonna be able to run their country because they're blacks, they're not smart enough. So Charlie Manson convinced his followers, and I, I'm gonna take you into the bottomless pit, then we're gonna come out of it after the civil war, and, and I'm gonna be the next leader of the United States. His crazy 19-year-old followers believed him in their drug-addled LSD you know, uh, psychosis, went out and murdered Sharon Tate and some other people. And then one of his followers got arrested and was in jail, but she was so excited about, about the murders that her cellmate, who was a prostitute, was saying, have you heard about these murders? And Susan Atkins said, oh, that was us. We, we went out and did the murders, thereby violating the conspiracy. What's the point? People can't keep secrets. So there's a murderer. The, the entire purpose of the, of the murderers was to convince Americans that black people were starting the civil war. She broke the con conspiracy by bragging to a cellmate, and yet somehow we're supposed to convince that 400,000 people, civilians, have somehow kept the Apollo completely secret, right? You see, so this is the kind of logic that nobody talks about. They go on about, well, the, the, the cameras didn't have, you know, all good argu technical arguments to get the moon missions, but no one gives a young person an argument that they can understand. And in fact, this relative mine said, I want to start recording you in a conversation because young people need to hear your argument. So the shorter answer is, you know, we need to solve this uh, incredible uh, science illiteracy, and it's even worse than that. It's believing completely insane nonsense that if if humans start to believe that stuff and start to implement policies, we're going to see some very very dire things happening in the world. And we've seen that already in. I mean, Putin's a nutcase, and he's just, uh, you know, started a war based on false premises and and uh, killing hundreds of thousands of people, right, and causing uh, calamities in the world. So we see what happens when we have people who believe uh, fake news uh, taking over com countries in which they control the military-industrial complex. So there's my political rant. Get involved. <laughs> no, that's, you, you know, I, 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 I agree on that. Stuff, tell them why it's crazy. <laughs> Okay, so that was a really nice uh, set of questions and an answer from you. Um, now we have the closing question. It might be a one word answer, but it's nice to actually close the interview. Reflecting on your passion towards your discipline, do you think loving what you do comes with time? Uh, in a sense, yes. You know, I. I so to go back to the beginning of my story, I always kind of liked maps and geography. I don't know much about geology, you know, 
kind of like museums, you know, natural history museums. I will tell you that, you know, some of, you know, joy is a, a, a rare feeling. And I've had feelings of joy in just lying in bed at the end of a field day, knowing that I commandeered the observations that day. Or that feeling when I'm practicing a lot or playing in bands a lot and you're just flying around the drum kit and it's just it feels like magic and it's flowing so we have those privileged moments in our lives they're rare you know I'm, I'm a pretty happy guy most of the time but that feeling of unadulterated joy is fleeting and very rare you never know when it's going to hit but a lot of times it comes from those moments when you realize that you've totally nailed it you've commandeered it you know or maybe you give a talk and you know, I remember, I remember I gave a talk once and it was standing room only, but the first talk, talk I gave an APG, there was me and the, the Bill Galloway and there was a, a few a few judges in the audience. And I said, Bill, there's not many people here. Bill said, the important people are here. You know, that was the beginning of my career. No one knew, knew who I was. I've got a weird name. People probably thought I would have a heavy Indian accent. I'm born in England, so, you know, uh, but I remember that feeling of giving a talk where there were literally, you know, maybe a thousand people in the room and going like, holy crud, I've made it, you know. Uh, so, yeah, those are the happy moments. Okay, Jano. Uh, thank you very much for all your thoughts. And yeah, thank you and congratulations for the award. So to be here, it's great to win the award. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, folks in Pittsburgh. And uh, I hope that anyone watching this gets something out of what I have to say. So thank you very much. <laughs>